All right, we've got Ann Coulter on the line who just spoke at UC Berkeley up in Northern California. Now, did she speak? Was she able to speak through all the craziness? She did. In fact, we have some sound of the protest. Let's listen. Anne would use this as her wedding song. <laughs> I know Anne. <laughs> she says, bring it on. Ann Coulter, author of Resistance is Futile, who you can follow on Twitter at Ann Coulter. Good morning. Hi, Anne. I guess you couldn't play the more popular chant of F U Ann Coulter. Oh, that's <laughs> And Ann Coulter has got to go. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll be playing the, um, the F you want it, you want it. Ann Coulter. <laughs> <laughs> Much. You know that really shows my power. I, I, so I good always not to be forgotten. I always refer back to Bill Maher, who talks about Berkeley and how disgusted he is. You know, this uh, supposed land of free speech started at Berkeley in the '60s, and look where we've come. And uh, but you were still able to speak. There were just protesters there, which really just brings more attention to your appearance. I would think, right? Uh, yes, and we beat them. So ha ha ha! It was a massive triumph. Um, the administrators did very little. They were on the side of the protesters, of course. There are no consequences for blocking entrance, for attacking people to come to see the speech. There were 2,000 of these lunatics um, blocking all the entrances. And they, their stated objective was to prevent me from speaking. But um, ha-ha, I won. I spoke. It was lovely. Took lots of questions and answers. Um, and And a good time was had by all. So the protesters were not... Uh, allowed inside they did you have anybody well, sure if oh. they if they bought a ticket but oh. then thank you for contributing to the college yeah. republicans well, and and you know also what? i don't i don't think they can read or <laughs> formulate arguments hey, hey. Well, also, though, Anne, isn't it just about free speech? That's so, not annoying at all, by the way, producer. If, you, if you're speaking... Not at all. <laughs> when we're in the middle of a conversation, I'm going to start blowing a rape whistle at random. <laughs> all right. See how so, you guys enjoy it. When you're uh, on stage, and I would think, and this is what the democracy is about, it's about spirited debate. I, I, I don't have to agree with everything, but be civil about it. So maybe, I, did you get any civilized questions that were on the other side of the aisle, or was it just... Oh, all- yeah, low- of them. I mean, okay. once once we were in the room, it was like most college speeches, um, or at least most college speeches with with decent um, average SATs. Let me put it that way. Um, I've I've given I've been giving college speeches for about 15 years, probably more than anyone else. And I wrote about this in one of my books. It's striking that that um, I would know what kind of reception I would get based on the average SAT scores. Um, they're not throwing food. They're not shouting at Harvard and Yale. No, they want to outwit you. They're waiting to get to, you know, question and answer. And, they, you know, they listen. And sometimes they come up with good questions. There were some good questions. Uh, I would say at least half were from liberals. Delivered perfectly politely. Um, I'm much nicer to liberal college students than I am to liberal adults, for example. Um, so that part was fine. Um, 2,000 protesters, um, other than being a massive tribute to my power and the power of my words, um, it is pretty outrageous that Berkeley, a state university, I mean, you're paying for this, um, allows this to go on and, and really with no consequence to – to the people doing the protesting. I, I mean, forming, the, uh, everyone came in. We started on time, or at least as on time as Ann Coulter ever starts a speech. We were about 10 <laughs> minutes late. Um, I think it's very important to be a few minutes late, so they're, they're, they're tingling with anticipation. Um, um, but, you know, they were forming human chains to prevent, and, and <laughs> one of the, one of the funniest aspects to what I've been hearing from audience members, either blogs or email, <laughs> when actually faced with someone who might hit them back. Um, one guy told me, um, he said he's walking in, and he's an older guy, he's six years old, um, you know, buff fellow, uh, but he said, I couldn't believe it. One of these guys hit me. He's out of the blue. He sucker punches me. So I square off against him, and he's such a coward, he won't look me in the eye, and I deck him. He goes running off. 
Um, a couple other ones told me um, some of them started to chase them, but they just had to. They they just ran and told me that communists are very slow runners. Uh-huh. So when it comes one to one, the audience, I think even the girls were were pretty much holding their own. Um, but still, I, I mean, the, the order from the girl chief of police of Berkeley um, was was essentially. Um, that the cops can't do anything. Well, they, they did arrest to... seven people. I don't know who they no, arrested. No, they arrested five, and four of them were given citations. Oh, okay. They weren't even thrown in jail overnight. They, said... they should have rounded up 50 of them and, and thrown them in jail for the night. You can't. <laughs> I mean, but... this should be like someone surrounding your wedding. And, yeah, but isn't and that also people trying to attend, attacking the bride and groom? This is an event that was planned. You can't just stand on a public sidewalk and prevent people from entering and abuse people. How about surrounding um, Chief Bennett's house on Thanksgiving Day so that no one can enter, including her, including the turkey delivery, cursing, bringing mental mental patients to curse at her guests. Um, I, no, I have plenty of complaints with, and, and the cops were, were magnificent. Um, but this business about how, oh, we spent $4 million on Ann Coulter Security. You know what we didn't need? We didn't need a SWAT team. We didn't need helicopters. What we needed was a few of these lunatics being thrown in a paddy wagon. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of when the left tries to take the death penalty off the books. What they do is they do everything they possibly can to run up the cost. And yeah. then they say, it's well, you know, we'd support it if it wasn't so damn expensive. And it's like, wait a minute, you're the one that made it so expensive. Yes, exactly. Perfect analogy, John Phillips. Yes, yes, yes. And now they'll turn around and say, oh, these conservative speakers are so expensive. No, no, give me 20 policemen under my command. And I'm not saying, you know, anybody should be should be shot as much as I would like to um, and be, would be doing the world a favor. Um, but but in, there are methods of crowd control, and it doesn't involve ordering your strong, tall policemen to stand around in their ninja outfits doing nothing. Yeah, it just seems like a total waste. The money, the money, well, you guys, everyone listening right now paid for for this waste of money. But despite all of that, the administration hoping the protesters would win, the 2,000 protesters, and there were 2,000 at two separate entrances, so it was very hard to get to the hall, um, except um, um, with my panther-like reflexes and uh, (laughs) excellent security team. Is this only in America? Like, when you go speak in England, is it like this? It's not, right? I'm just curious. No, actually, the only other place, and I, I never saw the venue, so I don't really know what happened. Hilariously, was, <laughs> was in your Canada, Jillian. Oh. You may remember a few years ago, I was giving speeches across Canada. Um, and uh, where was it? Um, what's your capital? Ottawa. Uh, Ottawa. Yeah, that's what I thought. It just didn't seem like a good name for a capital. Ottawa. Um, it is a good name. I mean, I love the Indian names. With Thanksgiving coming, we're, we're honoring the Indian. A lot soldier. of, uh, yes, Canada is based, there's a lot of cities based on that. And England, of course. It was and- Ottawa where I never, I had a nice a nice dinner with, with donors or, I don't know, a cocktail party or something. I was still at some fancy exclusive club when the cops said, no, we're calling this off. So I didn't really have any choice in the matter. Um, I get paid either way, so okay, fine. Um, but I, I, I don't really know what happened. They were knocking over book tables and pulling oh. the fire alarm. But those, like I say, it's, those and very John polite Canadians. it's nice. <laughs> very polite Canadians. I've, and it's never happened in, in, the, in the U.S. And then, of course, the last time at Berkeley, mm-hmm. I didn't cancel. The police didn't cancel. Berkeley didn't cancel. My sponsor canceled. <laughs> yeah, that was silly. All right, Ann, we got to run. Thank you so much I, for stopping by. I wish you could go back on Bill Marvin. He's out for the year. I'm so bummed. Because I like when you're on there. All no, right. he's getting to be kind of a lazy bum. Well, he, because he <laughs> can. For the year? It's not even Thanksgiving yet. Because he can. He, he, he You know what Trump, That's he said, true. has made him so exhausted, he's taking extra time. <laughs> 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 All right, Ann, thank you so much. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. And go follow Ann on Twitter at Ann Coulter. Let's take a look at the roads. Now, without any further ado, I would like to introduce 13-time New York Times best-selling author, syndicated columnist, and media personality, Ann Coulter.
well the competitive <laughs> <laughs> uh, I am one to let bygones be bygones, but I thought I'd begin by just giving a very short summary of the speech I planned to give two years ago. Um, <laughs> that went well. Which was, um, I can say it in one sentence, um, you know all those laws that have been passed by Democrats and Republicans in Congress, generation after generation, sent to presidents, both Democrat and Republican, banking out compromises, uh, ending up on the books as our immigration laws, I think we should enforce them. that was going to cause riots. Uh, tonight, the main point I wanted to make about our immigration policies um, is that the media and both political parties are lying to you. Uh, I've always said that pretty much anything you read about immigration in the mainstream media is a lie. It, it's always, for me, like one of those Highlights Magazine's puzzles. Where is the lie? How do they sneak this in? Um, but the point is, they are selling out your future, your wages, your country, all to benefit a tiny group of plutocrats. While you're busy obsessing, well maybe not you, um, <laughs> while many students are busy obsessing over hate speech and transgenders, your, your future is being mortgaged away. The official Republican Party position on immigration is no different from the Democratic position. That's right. That's right. Today the two parties are um, the Washington Uniparty, representing the donors, and the American Party. And this is why everyone was floored when Trump sailed to the top of the polls, crushed in the primaries, really on the issue of immigration. The elites were shocked when he said he wanted to build a wall on the Mexican border. Um, not so much that he wanted to build a wall, but that we still have a border with Mexico. Shortly that before... Wall. The fuck you! The policies that you're trying to put are putting these children in a box. Who could have guessed that Donald Trump's appeal um, to the small niche group of voters, the American people, would be so popular? Certainly no one in, in my party, the Republicans' brain trust, uh, you, you may not remember this, but shortly before the first debate, um, sponsored by, by Fox News, um, Rupert Murdoch put in an order with Roger Ailes at Fox News, take Trump out. Um, I guess it would be racist for me to mention that Rupert Murdoch is an immigrant. Uh, didn't work. Simply by talking about immigration, Trump was better than all the other candidates. It was as if the rest of them said, no, 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 we're not going to get in the dust. We're, we won't take steroids. And Trump said, screw it, I'm taking steroids. <laughs> it's, it's, you must admit, he's sort of a preposterous candidate. What drove him to victory was immigration. Um, for, for years, for decades, the, both, both political parties and the media have had a gentleman's agreement. Never talk about immigration. Just don't talk about it. Or, or they'll say, okay, you can talk about it, here are the ground rules. You can't use the following words. Illegal alien, amnesty, sanctuary city, third world, anchor babies. Uh, well, racist. Donald Trump made them talk. All right, out of here, that's it. Let them out. Let them out. on campus, so, so I specifically cut down the length of my speech so we could have an extra long question and answer. Um, since we just took their $90 donation, but them, if somebody else can remember, because um, I'm going to forget, they made a really important point, somebody remember to ask me about being a fucking Nazi, and I, uh, the rest of it I didn't get, but maybe you heard it through the screen. I was talking about the words that set off liberals. Set off liberals. Uh, Donald Trump's approach was to go through and use every single of the, one of the words you're not supposed to use. Um, immigration, anything. It's, it's been a lot of fun. Um, everyone was hysterical when Donald Trump started saying anchor babies. There's 
there's nothing racial or sexual about anchor babies. It's a boating metaphor. The idea is the illegal alien oh, God damn it. Um, fake citizenship um, anchors the entire family here. Get them all the way out. Uh, you know, what are you going to do? Deport the, the parents of an American citizen? The theory of anchor babies is if I successfully break into your house, I get to own it. Or if I don't get to own it, at least my kids get it. Oh, you don't want to punch the children and the poor children. This, this isn't a rule we really use for anything else. I think Trump should try it with immigration. Oh, come on. It's hurting Barron's feelings. Don't punish the child. Or Paul Manafort. How about his kids? Um, they thought they had a lot of money for weddings, for vacations. Um, what? Do you have to punish the children? They did nothing wrong. Now, this is an argument that is used no place else. Sorry, it sucks when your parents broke, break the law. Not only do illegal immigrants get to come live here, um, but they get to bring their cousins. Because we wouldn't want immigrants to be um, poverty stricken, um, um, low skilled, and lonely. <laughs> so. I guess bring their cousins, and the cousins get from their cousins and, and sisters-in-law. But um, this this isn't family reunification; it's village reunification. In America, your family is your spouse and your little kids, your minor kids. It's not you know your second cousin and your brother-in-law. That's third world stuff. But because of family reunification policies. Our immigration um, policy requires us to take, you know, a donkey, donkey cart operator who's illiterate in his own language, never mind ours, over a surgeon from Denmark. The vast majority of immigrants to America come in under family reunification. We have no say. Oh, that's the cousin. Do you think there's any place else in the world so stupid not to take the best immigrants it can get? Try calling up another country's embassy and saying, um, how do I get get to come live there? I hear the climate is nice, I like the food, I have no skills or money. Um, and hey, if I can't make it in your country, would you mind cutting me a check once a month? <laughs> They'd say, not so fast, Skippy. <laughs> By contrast, our immigration policy is anyone who lives within walking distance. <laughs> this weird idea is they can all hold that it's somehow unfair to take the best immigrants we can get. Um, how about, it's unfair for that top model to take, date a rich professional athlete. She should be forced to date unemployed losers. <laughs> or, or, or how about the uh, New England Patriots start using a lottery system to choose their players? Oh, it's unfair for that blind midget to lose out to the 300 pound loser. <laughs> yeah, our new site starting linebacker is a 99 pound guy who's nearsighted, but what can he do? He's Tom Brady's cousin. <laughs> That's our immigration policy. We're the greatest country in the world. Uh, we're told, as if it's good news, that immigrants use um, um, government assistance, welfare, at only 15% above the native rate. <laughs> it's like being told, oh, don't worry, only 15% of the food has rat feces in it. No, we don't want any rat feces. We don't want any immigrants accepting government assistance. If we're bringing in people, Discussion we're not this taking today, the right people. We should bring people better than security. us. We can take anyone we want. Uh, we can't pay for our own poor people. We can't pay for our own vets. We can't pay for our own very sick. Now we're what? We're going to be the welfare ward of the world? The media, uh, or at least my favorite media, MSNBC, seems to think they're not. <laughs> Their most compelling argument for mass immigration is to keep putting in indignant immigrants on TV to yell at us. I came here as a refugee, and, and look, I've worked hard to elect liberal Democrats. I'm working to bring in more, more people from the country that I fled because it was so horrible. Uh, no, actually, we were hoping for something more like, I invented a cure for cancer. I batted 400 last season. When Trump merely proposed we stop admitting immigrants whose religion teaches them to kill us, <laughs> both, both political parties blew up. The Democrats, of course, it's racist. That's what they always say when they don't have an argument. Uh, Republicans said, um, that's not who we are. They know me so well. <laughs> it's who I am. Between the 9-11 attack committed by 19 immigrants, 
um, and Trump's election, we admitted two million Muslim immigrants, far more than, than were coming from our, our mother country, Great Britain. Um, so exactly how many million do we have to admit uh, to not be called racist? Three million? Four million? Will they put a figure on it? Hey, New York Times, how about asking those Muslims you're, you're so dying to get what they think about tra transgenders using the little girl's room? Why should we be taking um, um, any, any people whose religion teaches them to kill us um, when we don't, have to take, we don't have to take any, none at all? What's the upside to bringing in fundamentalist Muslims? There's absolutely no legal or constitutional requirement that we take everyone from all over the world. Uh, we could ban redheads, we could ban left-handers, we could up and ban people who are, who, are, who are short or people who are tall, whatever the president thinks is in the best interest of the United States, as the Supreme Court found, um, after being told um, from the New York Times editorial pages and from, again, my favorite media, MSNBC, it's unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional, you can't have a Muslim ban, which wasn't a Muslim ban, I just like to fondly think of it that way. Uh, no, the Supreme Court said both by Constitution and by an express statute, the president can ban whomever he wants. There's nothing racist about a Muslim ban. You can be born into a Muslim family. You can't be born believing something. Uh, I think um, the immigration checkers back in 1941 at Ellis Island and Fayette a German aspiring immigrant, and after they slap him on the back, give him a tuberculosis test, test his head for life, lice, if they had gone through his, his suitcase and found um, a copy of Mein Kampf that was underlined, you know, bookmarked, footnoted, I think they'd say, no thanks. That's really all we're asking for here. Uh, can't we learn from what's happening in Western Europe right now? Um, they have loads of the Middle East moving in, um, and apparently it's quite complicated for, for the new Muslim refugees um, to be on their best behavior for the first six months. They don't have one like head Muslim to tell them, hey everybody, no raping anyone, just for the first few months. They actually have classes in Germany to teach the refugees, the Muslim refugees, don't rape the German girls. And they can't get it. They're, they're proving surprisingly intractable on this point. Um, they need refresher courses, it's not taking. Uh, even if they're infidels, no, you still can't rape the German girls. Even if she's wearing a short skirt, no, no, just write it down. Prove notes. You can never rape the German girls. Damn. No, it's counterintuitive. I don't understand. It's like turning into the curve. I don't understand it. <laughs> The whole idea of humanitarian um, immigration, refugees, asylum, is that the conditions in the home country are so terrible, they just have to get out. They're being persecuted for race, religion, um, gender, whatever it is. They gotta get out, just get me out, get me out. Um, which is why most refugees resettle in the countries in the neighboring area, in the same area. The climate's the same, the culture's the same. When conditions improve in the home country, they can go back. Um, consequently, um, during the S Syrian Civil War, the vast majority of Syrian refugees settled in, in that general area of the world. About 20% went to the generous welfare systems of, of Western Europe. But we also took tens of thousands of Syrian refugees. And I look at that and think, wait a second, are France and Germany taking any Central American asylum seekers? Oh. Well, how do, why are we taking any? Israel, a country with self-respect, um, is in Syria's backyard. You know how many Syrian refugees they took? Zero. When they had refugees pouring in a few years ago from Eritrea and Sudan, they instantly threw them in detention camps. How about AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez? How about you go cry at those detention camps? Eventually, they took about 12 of them in. The rest of them are still in detention camps. They also bent a, built a wall about 180 miles on their southern border. First year, it was 99% effective. That wasn't good enough for Israel. They put a few enhancements in. It's now 100% effective. Can Nancy Pelosi go to Israel and tell her, or tell them, that walls are immoral and ineffective? Oh, no, no, not a peep about that. 
Japan, which is about as far away from Syria as the United States is, they took 20 Syrian refugees, not 20,000, 20. Another country with self-respect, but luckily for the Japanese, um, they're not white, so they don't get accused of white nationalism for having a self-respecting immigration policy. It's an amazing fact that Trump is the first major presidential candidate in my lifetime who said we need an immigration policy that's good for the people who already live here. Uh, the media, media conveniently forget this. Um, he was cheated out of being a major party candidate by Hillary Clinton. Uh, but when, Trump, when uh, Bernie Sanders ran for president, he had the, four years ago, he had the Trump position on immigration. Shocking, shocking the low testosterone boys at Vox. He was interviewed by, by Ezra Klein, Ezra thinks over all friends here, yeah, open borders, isn't it great, Bernie? And Bernie said, no, open borders is a Koch brothers proposal. And I brought his, his quote. What right-wing people in this country would love is an open border policy. Bring in all kinds of people, work for two or three dollars an hour. That would be great for them. I don't believe in that. Then he checked back with the Democratic mothership and found out um, the immigrants are voting for us, Bernie. <laughs> and thus ended the revolution as far as Bernie Sanders was concerned. The laws of the ironclad laws of supply and demand just flew right out of his head. Um, it's, I, I love Bernie Sanders more when he was a socialist than when he became a Democrat. Um, it's kind of touching that Democrats realized they could never get Americans to vote for them. So they had to import foreigners. Oh, they'll vote for us. What I can't understand is why the Republican Party is helping them. Oh yes, now I remember. Republicans want money from the donors who want the cheap labor. The reason we can't use immigration to bring in the best people is because our best people don't want immigrants competing with their kids. They want immigrants competing with their landscapers' kids. As the saying goes, cheap labor is only cheap for the employer. That means your wages are being driven down. That mean, means more taxes will be taken out of your paychecks someday when you're paying taxes, you young whippersnappers. <laughs> because those cheap wages have to be made up for with housing aid, food aid, um, you know, all the child care, the SNP, SNAP programs. No, the middle class is subsidizing the rich's need for cheap labor. I always tell people, if you're not sure what your position on immigration is, ask yourself, do I have a nanny, a housekeeper, a chef, a pool boy, or some other generalized need for a lot of cheap labor? Because if you don't, our immigration policies are a net loss for you as a worker, as an employee, and as a taxpayer. But any suggestion that we protect American jobs is met with, well, what do they say when they don't have an argument? Racism. It's considered rude to notice the ill effects of, of immigration on American, on the people who already live here. Uh, the saying in the Cold War used to be, uh, better dead than red. Today, the motto is, better dead than rude. Wow. The typical Republican response when, when faced with, with accusations of racism um, is to grovel, go prostate, say, oh no, I'm sorry, I didn't realize that the New York Times had made a finding that that word was offensive. And the New York Times would sit back and wait for you to submit your resignation letter. Um, thanks to Trump, we found out they don't really have a plan B if you don't instantly go prostrate. <laughs> oh my gosh, we expected you to grovel. We don't know what to do now. Uh, luckily for people who support illegal immigration, most of our illegal immigration is coming from Central America. <coughs> Um, so um, they can claim that there is race involved here, um, if only it were from you know Eastern European countries, the Tartars or something. Then well, I don't know. I guess it would still be racist. Maybe it was racist what I said about Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> <laughs> this has nothing to do with race or ethnicity, and even if it did, immigrants, you're not black. <laughs> I find myself saying that quite frequently. Um, immigrants are trying to piggyback on the black experience in America. The whole reason Americans are duly, appropriately sensitive to racial issues is because of the legacy of, of slavery. And then Jim Crow. Democratic policies, I might note. But I could upset people in the audience, so we'll skip that. I won't even say it. Uh, African Americans got the short end of the stick for about 200 years. Yeah, we owe them something. What are we 
do to somebody who got here yesterday? <laughs> if you have grievances, go home and address the perpetrators. We didn't do anything to you. No, all we do. and you know, save the rest of the world, save them from warlords and, you know, Nazi sociopaths, save them from famines and earthquakes and tsunamis. <coughs> no, by my reckoning, they owe us. That's right. At least, at least with Europe, you know, okay, European countries have colonies, I don't really understand why they, they get, now, now we get to, we get to move back. We hated you guys, but we're coming back, Jack. Uh, we didn't have any colonies, we were a colony. But immigrants come in and immediately act like they're the descendants of American slaves. To be giving diversity points and set-asides and all of the things, some I think are good ideas, sometimes I would do other things um, to make up for the legacy of slavery. To be doing that to immigrants is nothing but an anti-American program. <laughs> Sorry immigrants, but you're in with the rest of us who are not descended from American slaves. Amen. So there's definitely racism um, in the immigration argument, um, but not from not my side, not from Trump. Um, first of all, um, we have immigrants denying the unique experience of African Americans in, America, in, in this country. Um, but secondly, if anyone has a right to be screaming racism, it is black Americans whose wages are being driven down. Study after study after study has shown that people who are hurt the most by low-wage immigrants coming in are African Americans. So first you steal black people's history, then you steal their wages. Yeah, yeah, I'm the racist one here. Um, the fact that anyone other than the very rich supports our immigration policies can only be a result of the total left-wing domination of our media. It makes absolutely no sense. If immigrants competed directly with journalists, or say a college professor, dare I say college administrators, <laughs> senators, I don't think we'd be hearing quite so much about, uh, you know, importing the entire third world being part of our fundamental values. The poor are getting poorer, the social safety net is collapsing, but the rich are getting richer, and their domestics are a lot cheaper, you'll be glad to hear. In Los Angeles, everyone has a pool, boy. Um, even if they don't have a pool, they're so cheap. <laughs> Housekeepers, pool boy, gardener. It's so great. Look, it's one thing to be utterly self-interested and not care about ordinary Americans. Okay, fine, you're a selfish pig. But these immigration hawks walk around like acting like they're Martin Luther King. They think they're going to be a big hit with, with, <laughs> with the maid by, by saying, I want to bring in more people from the country you fled. No, I think she'd like a raise. I've, I've mentioned this before. It's one of my favorite favorite stories, um, I spent Christmas in Palm Beach, December 2016, when Trump was, was first soaring, Not the first primary hadn't been taken, but it was clear he was on his way to victory, um, and, and going to Christmas parties. All of the rich people um, were wandering around sort of shell-shocked, I was for Trump from, for the, from the beginning because of his stand on immigration. All the rich people, the plutocrats, the billionaires walking around saying, I don't understand it, we were all for Jim, but all the Hispanic help is for Trump. <laughs> yeah, they want their wages to go up. <laughs> I'll end now and take your questions. I cut out many pages so we can get to these important questions, but I do want to end with this. Everyone in favor of our current immigration policies is in it for his own reasons. Um, the rich want the cheap labor. The ethnic grievance groups want the increased media clout. The Democrats want the votes. The Republicans want, want the donations. You will notice that none of these reasons have anything to do with what's good for the country or what's good for you. Thank you. Two handsome men in the aisles. If you raise your hand, they'll take a mic to you. And don't forget the Nazi or question. Uh, and I just wanted to know your opinion on this little excerpt. Keep ancient lands your storied pomp, cries she beside the lips. 
Getting your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Yes, that's a poem. I prefer Opie from Muscogee, and I think Merle Haggard is much more respected than ever. Um, hello, Ms. Coulter. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for your courage for coming here despite all your And my question actually is about civil discourse. What do you think uh, it will take for there to be civil discourse once more between the Republicans and the Democrats in this country? That's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question. really changed, I think, since Trump was elected. Um, I mean, I'm not blaming the victim, but I used to give more college speeches than I think anyone. You know, liberals would come, they'd stand up a question and answer. Um, I don't think this would have happened at Berkeley in 2017 um, if there weren't this weird, passionate hatred of Donald Trump. In fact, and the weird thing is, that's part of what makes him so attractive to his base. The, all the people we hate, hate him. <laughs> I, I keep pointing out, yeah, but you're not doing anything. <laughs> what happened to the wall? What happened to, you didn't hire anybody who would help you get anything done with the promises. We had, don't really have the new trade deals. Um, but there is, there's something about that man that, that brings it out. And I don't know what you do about that. Um, and then I guess the second thing I think I do think it has I do think it has a lot to do with the college campuses um, and um, not the students as much as the administrators and the professors. Part of the reason I, I do love giving college speeches is that I often would be the only conservative students would hear in four years of college. And I'm sorry, just as um, a fan of liberal arts and and John Stuart Mill and speech and competing ideas, having the truth rise, I don't think that's a very good model of an educational institution. Um, so I guess I would say the colleges need to change too. Yeah. Uh, huge fan. So, um, I'm up. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this guy again. So I'm, I'm a huge fan. Actually, I'm on a date with the guy here right now. I don't, I don't know where he is because when we hop the border, it's my family got <laughs> separated. Uh, I'm right here, bro. I'm right here, man. <laughs> um, so I don't know, uh, but yeah, back in the he, he, the guy that's with me too. He uh, we both hated you. <laughs> and now look at this, I'm here. <laughs> I think you're awesome. Um, yeah, so anyway, uh, I, don't know much about your, I, don't, I don't know much about your background, but I love the things that you say. And how come you don't run for office? How what? I'm a governor of California. How come you don't run for office? And also, Epstein didn't kill himself. <laughs> Republicans in California, um, what advice do you have for us? And it just, the question stumped me. I don't know. I don't know. And then so I, 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 did, I did set to work on it. Um, and one thought I have is that, and don't get alarmed at the first step of my three-step process, but when we build the boat wall, we build it up around California. <laughs> we re regretfully allow California to secede. I mean, they don't like, they don't like Trump. Um, and we, you know, beautiful state, we're sorry to lose you, but you can secede. Um, and then I think the welfare benefits would not be quite as great. I think the moral fiber of the country of California would sort of collapse. We'd let that go on for a few years, and then we'd invade and take it back. Woo! Uh, hey, what's going on? 
Uh, I just wanted to know whether your perspective was uh, in favor of a total moratorium on all immigration, or if you prefer a high skill. And if you prefer high skill, it sounds like you're definitely more interested in a value meeting process in terms of you want to look at people's values. So my question then in that case is, who are these people who we would who would be able to get into the country who are so smart, you know, 180 IQ people who wouldn't be able to circumvent the value-based questioning that would occur right. um, in such a bureaucratic effort? Right, good question. No, I'm for a total moratorium, but when you say total moratorium, I mean, even from 1924 to 1965, immigrants were, were coming in, there, but total moratorium means it's not millions coming in. It does make a big difference. And the reason I say that is some time to assimilate the ones already here. I do believe it, that, that anyone can become, I think, I hope, anyone can become a great American. Um, I certainly know um, some great Americans who weren't born here. Um, and more patriotic than the most patriotic person in this room, more loving of our country. Um, I love that, but we need time to assimilate people. Um, I mean, if you read, you read de Tocqueville and, and, and our founding fathers about what a free country this is, one of the things de Tocqueville said was, freedom's a wonderful thing, but it's very hard to learn. And basically, by def definition, we're the freest country in the world. So any immigrant we bring in from any place is going to make us less free. Immigrants from England, they don't have free speech in England. Just take that right there. It might be easier because they speak English. Um, we don't have to build any mosques for them. But, but it makes it less free the more immigrants come in. So I think we need time to assimilate the ones already here. Dust off the books, get things in order, and get a program where we are skimming the cream from the rest of the world. And not just, and then, I mean, part of the reason we need a moratorium, because as you suggest in your question, any system to get the top talent, oh my gosh, I promise you, the rich are gonna abuse it, they're going to scam it, um, like the H1, the program. Um, that was supposed to be, you know, oh, very talented, very high IQ. And whenever you have the heads of, of Apple and Google and Microsoft testifying before Congress for the first time in public life, people are allowed to talk about IQ because they all talk about their high IQ immigrants coming in. Um, and then you find out who they're actually getting, in the, and a lot of times um, they're getting people doing, you know, basic computer programming. One of my friends, um, I know a lot of the I know a lot of the wealthy tech billionaires, um, and one of them used it. I think he just wanted to see if it could be done to get himself. Um, an, um, what do they call in the gym? A trainer. Personal trainer. Personal trainer. That's it. I couldn't think of the word personal. A personal trainer. Give me a break. That isn't a high skill. A lot of Americans can do that. It's a scam. So part of it is, it, it, it is to avoid the scam. And just the final point I'll make on that is if you really do love the rest of the world, there is a danger that we ought to at least acknowledge. If we go and skim the cream from all these other countries, who are they left with? We gotta leave some smart people. I mean, that was the idea of having um, foreigners come to our universities to teach them skills that they would then take home to their countries and make their countries better. So there's a balance on that too. But I just think for the time being, yeah, I think just a total, a break on everything for a while. Oh, hi, Anne. Uh, Hello. For, um, <laughs> Taking time out of your day to come and share your ideas with the UC Berkeley community and defend your free speech. So, Mike, I know your speech talked a lot about immigration, but I want to clarify what your stance was on the trade war that's going on. Sure. So, I'm a Cal student and I also run a semiconductor and blockchain company. Uh, we started a joint venture with two Chinese companies uh, a year back, and then we've been facing egregious trade practices from things like coercion, threats of detention, intellectual property theft, and so on. So I believe that experiences like mine show why Donald Trump started this trade war in the first place, and that China has in fact been taking advantage of US companies. So my question is, what can small businesses do, like mine do to see, um, mine can seek reparations um, for the damage done, and what your solution would be to find, um, find a resolution to this trade war and fair treatment towards US companies? Um, sure, trade isn't really my issue. I'll make this quick. I do think that tr our trade policy should be to benefit 
like, like everything else, like immigration, like foreign policy. Let's do it to benefit the people already here, um, and not just the plutocrats. Um, I, I don't know why this China thing is taking so long. Um, it was one of the things, um, it was recently brought up to me again on C-SPAN, I leaked nothing, but it leaked one month after I was in the Oval Office having a shouting match with the president. It was around April 2017, and, and I was, that was one of the things I was yelling at him for. You said you were going to end NAFTA. Um, what's going on? You've done, you've forgotten all your promises. Where's the wall? Okay, well, the immigration is down now. That's because everyone Sorry, thinks see. you're going to be a tough enforcer. Once they figure it out, it's going to go soaring back up, which it Sorry, did. Thank you. Um, but basically, um, as I understand it, China's been eating our lunch on trade. They're not walking away from a deal. What we want is a trade deal where they're required to buy more of our products. That, I don't know why this is so hard to bang out. I think it's probably because of warring forces within the Trump administration. I don't know why he has this thing of hiring people who disagree with all of his all of his promises. Sure, to us. What trade is working? Yeah, smart with you. He has Peter Navarro. On the other hand, he has Larry Kudlow. Why don't you hire well, people who agree with what he promised the American people? That would be suspicious too. Hi, Anne. My name is Cody. Um, I'm actually here as a graduate student researching political polarization. I read your book in summer 2017. Um, I'm studying through Humboldt State. I graduated at UC Berkeley in 2017. But which one? Oh, Adios America, the one. Oh, that's a good one. So, um, <laughs> I'm glad you think so. So, I appreciated uh, one thing that you specifically go into in your book, and that is discussing the African American experience and uh, stating that we do need to do things to uh, kind of amend the past. Um, I respect that. Uh, I'm just going to disclose, I'm, I had to reread the book. And if I can, can I hold the, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so I want to quote from your book. As part American Indian, this kind of hit me at my core. It said, uh, it's on page 51, there was no America until the British and Dutch arrived. They were not immigrants because there was no established society for them to move to. Without the white settlers, what is known as America would still be an unnamed continent full of migratory tribes chasing the rear end of a buffalo every time their stomachs growled. So I understand some people think that's funny, and you probably said that kind of as a job to be funny, but that's really only the, the only mention of American Indians that I recall from the whole book. And I was curious if you've had the chance to maybe revisit this rhetoric, if you have, if that's genuinely what you feel about American Indian people, or if God the question. Yeah. Um, no, in fact, I think that was incredibly insightful. Um, I think it's, it was a Harvard professor who's written more about Indians than anyone else. I think it's Robert Patterson. You should read his books. If I were going to be honest about what was going on, yes, some tribes were, were lovely and some were unbelievable. The Iroquois were absolute monsters. What they would do to one another when the English and the Dutch got here, they, they were greeted by some Indian tribes saying, would you please come help protect us from these guys? The Iroquois, among other things, um, I mean, the, the, just this, the absolute savagery, and they would dominate other troops. Oh my to God, I didn't know this. Them, make the male warriors, well, if they allowed them to live at all, dress like women. Yeah, there, there were some peaceful tribes, and we had peaceful dealings with them. But to act as if it was Hollywood's Pocahontas is an absolute lie, and a lot of Indians were very happy that we were here to come help them. Um, I do think, I will say, um, yes, as with, with African Americans, I, I, I think we've really done a bad thing to, to um, Indians. Um, not Native Americans, because like I say, they weren't Americans yet. Um, I mean, to be putting them on reservations where they're becoming alcoholics and the crime is through the roof. There are, there are other things I would do that I think would help them. And yes, I think we do. Uh, I mean, they're part of our, of our history. Um, it's an interesting fact about America, and it's a fact that I like about, about American Indians. In, in every other place, well, mostly Latin America we're talking about here, Indians are, are, are considered, you know, b beneath pond scum. 
It's only in America that it's like a cool, macho thing. We name our military armaments after Indian tribes. We name our sports teams. It's a macho, cool thing. You have people lying about having Indian heritage. <laughs> but she's not the only one. I mean, it's a very common thing. People, it's like a cool thing to be an Indian in this country. And I like that. And I, I don't like what, what we've done to them. Maybe once we get back to caring about America first, we can get to those things. Very good. Hi, first of all, as an Australian, I really appreciated your Rupert Murdoch joke. <laughs> um, and you said before that we have no duty to intake any more immigrants. How would you reconcile that under the responsibility to protect an international law? Um, International law is like Santa Claus. It doesn't exist. It's whatever the United States says it is. Um, I do agree with Donald Trump's approach to foreign policy. I mean, one of the most sort of stunning and exciting moments in the primary was right before the South Carolina debate. He's on stage with Jeb Bush, and he turned to him and said, your brother lied us into war. So, okay, at the time, I admit I wanted to shoot my TV screen now. The intelligence was bad. You know, the interagency, the CIA, were supposed to be down on our knees thanking God for it. Oh, yeah, they got that wrong. They got 9-11 wrong. They got the Shaw wrong. They've pretty much gotten everything wrong. So, I mean, looking through, through, through history at American intervention, it has often been um, created worse circumstances than what it was trying to fix, and Americans are dying for it. So I really liked Trump's, Trump's hands off, and Obama's, by the way. It was one of the things I liked about Obama. He wasn't one of these, let's, I mean, I think he screwed up in Iraq. He shouldn't have pulled out every last troop after he had won that war. He stole defeat from the jaws of victory. But by and large, Obama was not an interventionist. That was what Trump was running on. And oh, the reason I mentioned it was before the South Carolina primary. South Carolina is considered our most militaristic state, I believe. Um, it is one of the top states for sending people to the military, in the military. He turned around two days later and won that primary. So I think Americans are tired of war now. After we're still in Afghanistan, we're, after what did we accomplish in Iraq? Oh, again, footnote, I blame Obama for that. Um, I mean, this is part of the way the, the Bolsheviks came to power. The Russians were sick of endless wars. Americans are sick of endless wars. We wish the rest of the country well, or rest of the world well. We probably shouldn't be skimming off all of their absolutely best people. We ought to be educating them and sending them back. But mostly, I think the people we're paying the taxes for their nice air-conditioned offices and their parking spots and, and their secretaries, their concern should be us. I'm an immigrant. I came to this country when I was 14 years old. Just now, I, I climbed the Great Wall of China two years ago. Just now, climbing that three foot wall, the free speech of Berkeley Wall took me longer. And we were both assaulted. Sean and I and Alex were, were Luther, you got out there. Anyway, um, I thank you for making it through. <laughs> We all did what we had to. Out there, when I was uh, waiting to get in, I was called a Nazi. Nazi got out. I heard it 1,238 times. <laughs> he makes me, he makes me angry and sad because I'm an immigrant. How did they dare? How dare they call me a Nazi? And and, and to to gone through what we have gone through, just to hear you speak, is an insult to everyone in this room here. Free speech wall to hear you speak because we showed courage and we showed, showed resolve. Anyway, my question is Thank you, thank you for coming in. A friend in the area, a producer for a radio show, she was bringing her two high school kids, and I've 
thought she's gonna turn yes. away. I, I, yeah, I can believe I it's going on. I love him. Thank you. Nice My question to you is, uh, um, if you were the president of the United States, what are the three things you would do to improve this immigration policy? Build a wall. All right. Part of building a wall, I mean, I just want to throw this in after talking about how the working class has been screwed over, screwed over, screwed over by this country. And I'm, I don't mean this as a joke, but where, where is the infrastructure project? I mean, it would almost be useful for the government to have, I'm saying almost, I don't libertarians jump down my throat here, you know, pay people to dig a hole and fill a hole. Dig a hole, fill a hole. But I have an idea, instead of doing that, how about we create thousands of high paying government jobs building the wall? One of the things I've learned from watching my favorite network, MSNBC, is a very big thing on the left, this um, ban the box, ban the box, ban the box. What they're talking about is the box on an employment form where it asks if you've ever been convicted of a felony. Um, and that um, disproportionately affects African-American men. Oh, um, but, okay, I understand that, but for some jobs, you know, brings truck driver or working in a nursing home, really does make a difference if you were convicted of a felony. You know where it doesn't make a difference? On a construction site. I mean, if Trump had kept his promises, black employment would be soaring. The, the working club, we would have so many good paying jobs for young, strong men, and it just, I, it just drives me crazy, this missed opportunity. He's at least talking about it. And I, oh, one, one thing I'll just add to that since I just attacked Trump. Um, I, I, um, if you follow me on Twitter, you know I've been extremely testy with the president um, about not building the wall. And it occurred to me with this latest idiotic impeachment thing, they are never going to stop. To go back to what do we do about um, when will we have civil discourse again. Um, th th something about Trump just makes liberals lose their minds. They are never going to stop impeaching. And I was worried that um, if he gets a second term, he's, oh, he's definitely not going to keep his promises then. Then it's just going to be, you know, promoting a Bunkus shoe company. He doesn't have to worry about re-election. But I now think he might he has a different reason to keep his promises second term. In order to keep his base with him, he has to keep his promises. And they're never going to stop impeaching him. It's going to be five more years of this. <laughs> so that's the good news about impeachment. <laughs> <laughs> good evening. Um, my name is Mark. Hello, Mark. Hi. I, by my estimation, since like... Maybe World War II, the best thing America's got going for it in the world is the idea that America keeps its promises, right? We have amazing credit with the rest of the world. Yeah, I'll make it quick. Um, <laughs> with the reversal of America's position on, say, the Iran nuclear deal or the Paris Climate Accords, do you not feel that America's credit in the rest of the world is being devalued and that our ability to broker major international deals is being weakened by presidents and administrations reversing the decisions of one another. No, I mean, I disagree with your premise, I will say. Not that I don't think a country keeping its word, do think it's important, but is that what people really admire about us? I mean, we, we promised the South Vietnamese. <laughs> We protect them, and whoa boy, did we betray them. I think people admire America for being, for being a country that, that's free and prosperous, and I mean, happy, I hope we can keep it. It was the largest, the most successful, prosperous, enormous middle class. That was really the mark of being an American. We've never had so much income inequality as right now. It's been getting worse and worse and worse because of all of the low wage labor coming in. And the rich, I mean the billionaires, I, there's going to be a certain level of income inequality. I haven't gone Marxist on you guys. Um, if you have freedom, there will be some level of income inequality. But our immigration policy has specifically been to bring in people to compete with the working class and drive their wages down. Drive them down, down, down. But anyway, I don't think that's what um, America is admired for. Um, 
Yeah, and I guess that's it. I, I, I guess I might also say I'm not really sure that the Iran deal was such a bad idea. What? What? What Obama negotiated? I know we're all taught on Fox News you're supposed to hate him. He's a traitor. Blah blah blah. But um, I mean, we were giving money back to them that we were holding, and it's given me a really really good example about how foreign policy is always a quid pro quo. <laughs> we're gonna lift. We're gonna lift the sanctions. You stop building nukes. So all the, the current heat of impeachment hysteria is completely insane. That's what presidents do. Hi, Ms. Golder. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, my question for you is, what's your, stanch, uh, what's your stance on sanctuary cities, and what should we do with them moving forward? Well, sanctuary cities are a great example of how the public, the people, are with me on immigration, with Trump, with the pro-American side of immigration. There were two votes, whenever that election was, last Tuesday. One was in Liberal City in Arizona, I forget which one, Liberal County. The other one was in, you know, some, some place in New Jersey. Um, should we have sanctuary cities or banned sanctuary? Sanctuary cities lost by 70%. time Americans have been allowed to vote, they vote for less immigration. Going back, I mean, maybe it went back before this, but Plyler v. Doe, in, in, where, where Texas said, we don't want to pay for the educations of illegal aliens. 1996 in California, California said, we don't want welfare going to illegal aliens. All these initiatives, lots of them, in liberal states. Um, and, I mean, well, why am I going through, you know, stupid initiatives? We elected Donald Trump. It wasn't because, oh, he's so smooth. <laughs> he's a reality TV star, let's make him president. No, it was because of his position on immigration. So every time Americans vote, and most recently the sanctuary cities, but, but our, our rulers will not listen to us. Like I say, the Democrats want the votes and the Republicans want, want the donor money. Uh, hey, good evening. Uh, the woman a few uh, rows down stole my question, so I suppose I'll have to come up with another. Just kidding. Uh, you, you want to know if I'm a Nazi whore? <laughs> We'd love you anyways. Anyway, uh, so you discussed immigration tonight as mostly a labor issue. Uh, others, uh, sort of on your side, have characterized it as a security issue. I constantly hear people talking about crimes committed by undocumented immigrants. And uh, immigrants. Think, uh, yeah, and, and yeah, and legal migrants, and this was, you know, there was a murder up north, I think, a few uh, years ago that people kept talking about when Gavin Newsom was running for governor of California, and this is despite the fact Kate that... Kate Steinle, you can say the name. I don't remember the name, but thank you. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> this is despite the fact that we really don't have any statistics on the crime rates of undocumented immigrants compared to, uh, you know, m m regular citizens. And when we look at uh, legal immigrants, the numbers are the crime rates are slightly lower. So do you think we it's fair? To, either, but go ahead. So do you think it's fair to, despite having really no data to support this character, um, turn immigration into a security issue? Uh, if you do, why? And if not, how do you separate your rhetoric from the other that type of rhetoric? Um, for one thing, I highly recommend you read that magnificent book, Adios America. It's heavily about the crime issue. And you'll see in chapter seven, I mean, it's even worse than you described. Not only do we not have no data on the, <laughs> the crime rates, the types of crimes, um, that sort of thing, of illegal immigrants, we don't know about immigrants. And by the way, only my side wants to count. I find that suspicious right there. So, you know, I went through, uh, I don't, something else Trump could have done. I mean, the, we have census taking, um, you know, asking Samoans if they have battery powered radios, how many stair railings they are broken, do they have mold in their bathtubs? But we don't know how many people we're imprisoning who were born in other countries. We don't know if they're legal or illegal. We don't have a list of which kinds of crimes they commit. The, the evidence that exists, Looks like it's pretty bad. And my final point on that is exactly what I said about welfare consumption. We don't, we don't want to bring in immigrants who commit crime, oh, about the same rate as Republicans. They are not any more criminals. No, we don't want any criminals. We can choose whomever we want. It's like um, 
Okay, your refrigerator, your food has all gone moldy. When you go out to get new food, do you think, well, screw it, it's all moldy, I'll just get some moldy food. No, you can get any food you want. <laughs> get the fresh food. That's what our immigration policy should be. Is she, no, Anne, I'm Aaron Smith. She's left. Um, I'm a transgender and free speech and human rights activist. By the way, I just, I just barely missed you last year politically. Just so you know. In the green room. I didn't get a chance to say hello. You actually tweeted a meme of me punching Antifa in Portland. <laughs> That's you? That's <laughs> Aaron. I need your advice. Um, Aaron! Aaron! Um, a deputy vice chair of the San Francisco Republican Party, and our state senator is Scott Weiner. He is the guy who basically decriminalized giving someone HIV and some other crazy stuff. I have been asked to run against him as a Republican in the state senate. Do you think I should do that, even though it's such an uphill battle? Yes. 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 <laughs> the crowd has spoken. <laughs> Do it, Aaron. I must say, when I meet, I mean, I think my state's a little ahead of you guys. Whenever I meet, and I get, go to a lot of Republican events in New York, and I meet somebody running, you know, against, what's her name, Carol, Carol Maloney, and, you know, I'd say, great, you know, good for you. Why? <laughs> Why? I mean, yeah, it can be a lark, it can be fun. Um, I suspect it's an uphill battle, but... Who knows? Crazier things have happened. Donald Trump is our president. Yeah. <laughs> Do it, Aaron. And by the way, that was a great photo. <laughs> Hi. Um, uh, first of all, I'm here for free speech. Um, I'm a Muslim immigrant. I don't uh, agree with a lot of what you said, but I just like to say. When people call you and overgeneralize all Republicans as hateful Nazis, it feels the same way as how you generalize Muslims and Muslims. <laughs> and I'm a science major actor. Um, and do you feel like your style of delivery, sort of focusing on hate speech, and I know you have this sort of joking, um, politically incorrect style, which I understand may be relatable, but do you feel like the style uh, undermines your overall? real messages about immigration, and do you also feel like this style prevents conversation and more liberals from getting in here, because they're just gonna be, like, obviously focusing on that hate. Like, how are you gonna get people in here? Right, okay, well on your first point, um, no, I mean, obviously I am not saying all Muslims are going to kill us. My point is, if a very few of them do, I mean, look at what this country has been through. There was 9-11, and there was the Pulse nightclub, there was the Boston Marathon, there was out here San Bernardino. To pretend like that's the same as, oh, oh, it hurts my ears, I disagree. Um, no, it, it isn't the same thing. And I'm not saying that all Muslims, yes, I know most Muslims are peaceful, but what's the upside? Even, even, I, we don't need to accept anyone, as this young man asked me. I want a total moratorium, so that should make you happy. It's not like I'm fixating on you guys, but it, you know, it's a little hard to avoid the problems Western Europe is ha having. I mean, as for the people outside, I am 100% sure they couldn't smell, spell my name, have never read one thing I've written. The fact that they were, this is what insults me most of all, they are not following me on Twitter. Um, <laughs> posters denouncing me that say, impeach Trump, you know, screw Ann Coulter. Whoa, you haven't been following me on Twitter. Trump had to unfollow me. I was trolling him so much. So, um, I mean, one time I met one of my biggest fans. I was doing KABC in, um, in, in LA, and the, and the host brought in one of his friends, and he was a young kid, he had all my books, and I'm signing all, all of my books, and I'm not really, I'm just sort of chatting as I'm signing them, um, and said, oh wow, this is great, it's fantastic, you're a big fan, when did you become a fan? He said, when you spoke at UCLA, I was standing outside um, your speech with a bullhorn denouncing you, um, and then I was in a line or a bookstore one time, and I saw one of your books and thought, oh, I gotta see what this evil woman has to say. I started reading one of your books and said, oh wait, I agree with that. I agree with that. I agree with that. So, no, I, I think these are people who just enjoy violence, and they don't know the first thing about me. And 
Um, this was no insult to Muslims generally. Some of my best friends, seriously, are Muslim immigrants and very patriotic Americans. And look, they, they, they understand that this is a problem right now. We have a limited amount of money. We really need to spend it on our own people and not on extra security. Not extra security at Berkeley, and it shouldn't be extra security at nightclubs or marathons. Or, or, or boarding airplanes either. It's just schools? a problem we don't need. How about all the white school shooters, Dan? Yeah, to jail. Um, right? yeah. Unlike you, I think criminals should go to prison. Womp <laughs> womp. I would be perfectly happy to deport American criminals. Apparently, we or unfortunately, we can. We can decide who's coming in. If you've missed that point, you're really too stupid to understand anything, I'm saying. Hi, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, by far, my, the favorite event we've had here is the Berkeley College of Republicans. No, no offense to our previous speakers. Uh, <laughs> my question is regarding birthright citizenship. What's your opinion of it, personally? Uh, birth, uh, birthright citizenship. Oh, birthright citizenship. Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. Um, first of all, birthright citizenship is different from anchor babies. Everyone confuses this to confuse you. Birthright citizenship means you are, the, you are born in America to legal immigrants. This is one place where it makes a difference. That has made you a citizen, I mean, whether or not the Supreme Court was right, but they did decide that in, I don't know, 1891 or something. That has been the law for a long time. That is nothing like anchor babies. Um, that was invented by, by a single Supreme Court justice, slipped into a footnote in an opinion in the 1980s. Nobody noticed it. Um, no Congress has ever said, if, you are, <laughs> if, if your parents run across the border, you know, eight months pregnant and drop you, I mean, what kind of country would decide citizenship that way? It's not a game of Red Rover with Border Patrol. <laughs> This is a perfect example of what I was saying at the, right at the beginning. Everything you read about immigration is a lie. If you look it up right now on Google, but don't because I'm still talking. Um, <laughs> um, what other countries offer birthright citizenship? They'll claim they're like 72 countries. I've spent about a week looking into this. Then you look up the countries that allegedly have, not birthright, but anchor baby citizenship. Um, the children of, of illegals being like auto citizens. Um, then you look into it, and no, what they mean is what, I'm, what I just said about birthright citizenship. Oh yeah, if you're born in our country, you can become a citizen, as long as you know, one parent is a, is a citizen. That's the sort of thing they have. I think Canada is the only one right now, and every country that has tried it, even briefly, I think Spain did, within a year or two they drop it, but they realize it's just a magnet. So, but that's a good question. It's one of the ways, two of the ways, the media lie about immigration. Uh, we'll take one more. Oh, we have to close it. Oh, just one more. One more. One more. Oh, okay. I have to go. You've been fabulous. Thanks for making it. Hi, y'all. Dennis Prager here. 18 Prager 776. We'll continue with the show. Ann Coulter showed up in Berkeley. And uh, 2,000 students or 2,000 people. Are they all students? Do we know? 2,000 people, including many students, protested her visit. I'm going to have Ann on this week to talk about this. It's really uh, quite something. This is the L.A. Times. And, oh, man, it's such a nuisance. I have to log in. Okay, here we go. UC Berkeley keeps a lid on 2,000 protesters, allowing conservative commentator Ann Coulter to speak. 
The protest. By the way, they they're just not protesters. They they formed interlocking arms to stop students from hearing her. It's it's a little uh, it's a little darker than the headline. Some wore black. Some marched in a circle, yelling anti Coulter chants. Yeah, like f you. You should see the videos. It it really there's a, there is true in my lifetime the coarsening of American society has been a tragedy. Another victory for the left, who don't even understand why would I why would I object to students yelling f you. In diverse and liberal Berkeley, the student, the student and community protesters, community that's a left wing word. It's all made up. Community, like always, right? Isn't that community action, right? Community. You know, the irony is they don't have a community. The people who have communities are generally conservative and religious. <laughs> it's, the, it's another one of these Orwellian facts of life. They were particularly riled up by Coulter's anti-immigrant slams in her 2015 book, Adios, Adios, America, The Left's Plan to Turn Our Country into a Third World Hellhole. First of all, she's anti-illegal immigrant. They, they never, they never uh, make the distinction. They don't even use the word illegal any longer. What, what is it? Instead of illegal immigrant, what is it called again? Undocumented, Undocumented immigrant? So, yeah, you know, I came up with the idea we should call a uh, bank robbery an undocumented withdrawal. But Coulter came, she spoke, she left, and it all occurred without major problems, the kind of violent protest that shut down a 2017 Berkeley appearance by conservative provocateur Milo Yiannopoulos. Okay. Oh, Dan Mogulov, look at this. What was significant was what didn't happen. UC Berkeley spokesman Dan Mogulov said Thursday, we did not see the sort of violence, mayhem, and property destruction that attended to the event with Milo Yiannopoulos. Dan Mogulov is in no safe spaces, and he's very impressive. The guy, because you know why? The guy's a liberal, not a leftist. And he was totally happy that Ben Shapiro came to Berkeley. You'll see him in the movie. It's a very powerful uh, few segments with this guy. I remember his name because he impressed me. Police arrested five people, including three students, for resisting law enforcement. But you know what? It's really mind-boggling. If 2,000 2, protested, I would love to know how many were students because it's a little depressing. Why don't they go and hear her? She's one of the brightest minds in American life. I don't care if you disagree with her. She's so maligned, it's fascinating. I mean, I know she's abrasive. She's brilliant. I don't use that term almost ever. Her books are documented intellectual firebombs. Hi, everybody. You know what's really nice? I have to admit it. Here I am talking to you about Ann Coulter at Berkeley. Say, you know what? I really want to talk to Ann Coulter. And by golly, there she is. That is a good life. I am a blessed man, let me tell you. Ann Coulter, I just want you to know, I described you as one of the handful of brilliant minds in America prior to your coming on. Thank you. That's why I will call in any time, Dennis Frager. I thought you called in any time because of my wife. Well, that's the main reason. I, yes, I had a, I had a <laughs> feeling. That's correct. <laughs> hey, Ed, so uh, this this is, it's so sad that I, 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 I can't find the words to describe it, that 2,000 people protested your speaking at Berkeley. Uh for hours. This was a huge, historic victory. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry to the individual police whom I think would have liked to have done their jobs, but this was absolutely no help from 
um, Berkeley administrators or the Berkeley chief of police. Um, they wanted to make a big show. My suspect is after what happened to Milo, to me, to others, um, donors, and perhaps taxpayers, since this is a state university, are saying, what on earth, Berkeley? You're, you're releasing these violent lunatics on, on civilized speakers whom people want to come here. Um, so, so a lot of what was done was very showy. Um, they had two helicopter units and they had SWAT teams. But meanwhile, the police were prevented from doing anything. The objective of Antifa of 2,000 screaming lunatics was to prevent me from speaking. Um, they have the, the, the silent um, ascent of the university, and yet we, I went ahead and spoke, and people got in, and it was beautiful. So we beat Antifa, and we beat Berkeley. Good. I'm glad I, I, I got your, uh, your understanding of what happened. I saw a video of students locked arm in arm preventing students from hearing you. Is that accurate? Not really. I think a few people might have been turned away. Okay, good. Yes, yes, they were forming. Um, I mean, should it be that difficult to come in to see an, a best-selling author give a speech and take questions? They formed um, human walls, locking arms, cursing, hitting, grabbing at people, coming in. I talked to several of the audience members. The one, um, the proof of how successful... Um, certainly my security was, and there was a lot of it. Um, my security and, and others is that the one I, I figured probably hadn't made it in, and I, um, somebody in, toward the end of question and answer said, you know, what do you think of these protests, blah, 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 and I said, well, I'm here, and I feel absolutely safe right now, brought my own security, um, but I felt bad about it because I had invited the producer to a radio show, the Brian Sussman show up there I do a lot. She was bringing, you know, her high school kids. And I thought, oh, man, Sherry's going to get there and see this hoo-ha. Is she going to want to go through all this? And she called out. She made it into the audience. So I think pretty much everybody made it in. They, they sold more tickets, but, you know, who knows. All uh, right, so a few, few, all right, a few questions. How many attended? Uh, about 350, and they sold about 400 tickets. So a few people may have said, oh, man, this isn't worth it. Uh, but by and large, it was a I am, I, All right, so th- this, is, uh, this is an interesting question. Did they purposely give you a smaller venue? Um, not sure about that. I wasn't involved in that. What, what, what I, if, if only, you know, we were, we were monsters... <laughs> like the left, what I would like to do um, is collect, um, you know, since it's a smaller event, maybe a hundred mental patients surround Chief, Chief of Police Bennett's house around Thanksgiving, form a human wall, curse at anyone coming to her house, um, hit a few of them, and see if she would still take the position, oh, well, they're not committing a felony. No, of course you can't block people from going to an event. How about doing that to, you know, Gavin Newsom's next wedding? We'll just form a human human blockade so no one can get in, including the bride and groom. I mean, the fact that the police were not allowed to throw a few of these people in a, in a paddy wagon and just lock them up for 24 hours, I think we needed that a little more than we needed a SWAT team and the helicopter crew. No, this, what the university decided to do was make it look like spend loads of money. It's not their money. It's the taxpayer's money. But don't do anything that would actually be effective. So I'm getting a mixed message here that it was you feel you won, but you don't feel that they did what they had to do. Right. We won with no help from Berkeley. I see. That's the point. Uh Uh, When I say 2,000, we've defeated 2,000 lunatics, I'm including the Berkeley administrators. Uh, Um, You know, the vice chancellor and the chief of police issued public statements supporting the protesters before this. Really? Yeah. The chief of police? Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, My biggest question is, and maybe there's no way to know the answer, of the 2,000 or so protesters, how many were students? Um, unfortunately, more than you'd think. Usually they aren't. I mean, I'm not sure since there were only, um, five arrests and four of the five got citations. So that's really going to discourage future protests. 
No, they get a pat on the head. But of the of the five, um, I think about four were students, which was a surprise because I, I was with you. I assumed they were all just out of town agitators who can't spell Coulter, but it looks like a good time to bust stuff up, harass people, and face absolutely no consequences whatsoever. How did the students who were tenure talk react? They were actually really terrific. Um, it was a really, really good event. I think it's now online. What I liked about it was um, there were a fair number of liberals in the audience, um, but after um, this one screaming banshee was removed at the beginning, as I, I give a lot of college speeches, and, you know, the rule is you got to remove the first heckler, and then the rest of them will... will That's a very good speech. rule. Hold on with me. Ann Coulter is my guest. The Dennis Prager Show. It's a state of time in which we live. A statement, I should say, that a serious person like Ann Coulter needed needed helicopters, although I think, as she said, it's for show, but that 2,000 people protested. How many personal guards did you have? Um, I had a lot. I will, I will write about it all someday. Right now I'm just basking my glory. Oh, and I was about to, I was, I was complimenting the liberals in the audience um, when we cut to a commercial break. And what I wanted to say was, yeah, there were, I took a lot of question and answer until the administrator shut it down. And I would have taken questions for another hour, but they had to, you know, that was the end. We have to, you know, send the police home, blah, blah, blah. Um, but the, the liberal, even the liberal questioners, and this is my favorite thing about college speeches, ask perfectly respectful questions. Um, they were questions. Um, they respectfully listened to the answer. Um, and, and, you know, they were good questions. Even the screaming banshee I was mentioning at the beginning, as long as, as, long as you remove hecklers, the rest of them are going to want to stay and, and try mm-hmm. to beat you in question and answer, certainly at a high IQ school like Berkeley. Um, and even, even the screaming banshee was making the important point that I was a Nazi whore. Um, in fact, I think I never got around to answering that question. Wow, do you know I have to say I I really never thought I'd speak to a Nazi whore. Uh, <laughs> I, this is really a, a rare moment in my life. Yeah, there was the, a clever point. I had to, you know, cut No, 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 it's a toughie. One. I don't know how I don't know how they answer. It's like the guy when I spoke at UC Santa Barbara, he wrote a column that I, you know, that I was a a, a bigot and all of that stuff. And uh, I when I had him on the show, I said, "You know, I thought I knew me, but you, <laughs> you know me better. <laughs> they, it, the University of Wyoming pro, uh, had a c- column before I came, said I was an anti-Semite. <laughs> I, knew, I, I knew you'd love that one. They are like four-year-olds throwing tantrums. That's right. That is correct. And this is what the university wants. That is correct. Well, anyway, uh, I just, I'm glad I got you in. I wish we could talk longer, and we will. Listen, a wonderful Thanksgiving to you. Wonderful Thanksgiving to you too, Dennis, and your lovely and talented wife. <laughs> they, they have a real bond, I have to say. <laughs> I'm sort of like the third, the third wheel. No, f- the fifth wheel. But there are It's very complex. Am I the third wheel? If you're 30, that's right. If you're talking about a bicycle, thank you very much. Hey, listen, everybody, please give now. Go to my website. Go to the go to the Salvation Army banner, and don't forget that uh, that no, that my Bible commentary is on special sale at Amazon. I didn't even know it, but it is. All right. See you tomorrow.